Welcome to the Seven Skills for the Future podcast series. I'm Emma Sue Prince, and this podcast is all about developing skills that you already have inside you, adaptability, critical thinking, empathy, integrity, being optimistic, being proactive and being resilient. And today I'm delighted to be interviewing Nathan Martin. Nathan is Director of Global Thought Leadership at Pearson, and he's a key leader and contributor to the Pearson 2030 research into future jobs. So I'm really interested in talking to him about the skills that we need for the future. I'm delighted to welcome to the show today Nathan Martin, who's Director of Global Thought Leadership. Great to have you with us today, Nathan. Thanks. It's really lovely to be here and lovely to chat about this important topic. Yeah, so I'm really excited to know more about the future of work uh, research that you've been doing. Um, just tell us a bit about that work. Yeah, so this piece of research came um, has its origins a few years back, um, back in 2011, where two researchers from Oxford, um, and Frey and Osborne, had produced a piece of research looking at the risk of automation and looking at what that would mean for the future of work. And this piece of research um, uh, kind of was a bit of a bombshell within the, uh, in both the media and the ed- education and academic space because it predicted that up to 40% of jobs could potentially be automated, which really left a lot of people very fearful and scared and, and sparked all of these sort of headlines around, you know, are, are the robots coming to take your jobs? What, what's going to happen on that front? And that piece of research was very important, Um, but at the time, particularly as an education company and the team that we were working with, we we thought it only told one part of the story. And in fact, uh, Mike Osborne, who was one of the researchers at Oxford, also felt that it only told one part of the Mm -hmm. story and was a bit, um, kind of felt like that the the coverage, as it often does, didn't tell the whole story Mm -hmm. of even the research and what it was trying to do. And so Mm -hmm. we had the opportunity to say, you know, we think it's really important to make sure that we understand where we're going with the future, not just of education, but of work, and make sure that the skills and the things that students are learning in the classroom um, will really prepare mm. them for the world of work and how it's changing. Mm. And so we had the privilege of getting to work with um, Nesta and Oxford and, and to combine and look not just at automation, but look at how other trends that are going to be impacting mm-hmm. the future work, things like uh, climate change, things like mm-hmm. people are living longer, so an aging populace, um, just uh, it, excuse me, urbanization, so the mm-hmm. fact that people are moving into cities and mm-hmm. what that might mean, um, and th- even things like political unrest, and this piece of research was done before um, the current U.S. president was elected and before <laughs> uh, uh, Brexit, so uh, you can mm-hmm. imagine that it's only sort of accelerated, um, and what happened was we brought a group of experts together um, who, who came together to say how would they think these trends might impact yeah. them, looking at the past. But then they also looked and said, you know, what sort of skills that are underneath these occupations mm. are most mm. um, likely to still be in demand and be resistant now that's to that's what we're really interested in. About the skills. What are those skills, yes. Yeah, so, we, so what the skills that we, we hear them and they're brought up numerous, numerous times, and they're things like uh, fluency of ideas. So fluency of ideas... Um, is the sort of the ability to come up with many different ideas when you're faced with a problem. My favorite example is I had a friend that was on the show, uh, Taskmaster, which people mm-hmm. seem to really enjoy. And it's a great example of fluency of ideas. They're faced with these problems and they come up with kind of wacky and um, brilliant ways of solving those problems. And that's actually a skill that machines aren't really good at. And so if you have the ability to come up with many different ideas, yeah. then you're like, your job, and if that's part of your job, it's likely to be in demand. Other things might be um, the ability to sort information and sort of analyze it. Mm -hmm. Um, Things that are not um, based on movement, so, you know, be able to move a lever from one point to another, that's something that would be able to be automated. Mm -hmm. But those other skills are less likely. So it's sort of the human traits. Yes. Um, You hear things like problem solving, um, the ability to work with other people. Um, And those are the skills that are most resistant to automation. Yeah. And, I mean, our education system... Do you think that we are equipping young people with these sorts of skills? I think we are. I think we are in pockets. Um, Mm -hmm. I, you know, I'm sure it's the same for you, but we have the pleasure of getting to visit schools both in the U.S. and the U.K. and around the world, where um, people are doing amazing work. I was up in um, Bloxham um, a week or two ago, and 
they're actually redesigning their curriculum to try to think about how they can best prepare for the world of 2030 and really encouraging students to do things like pr very practical and not just say, hey, I'm going to go to a university when I graduate. And so I do see that in pockets. Yeah. I'm not convinced that on a systemic level that we're doing a great job of that. Um, but I do think teachers and schools are, are aware of those things that are important or trying to do it. But we can do more to support yeah. them. But that's encouraging to hear. That it it is. And I think it's, yeah. it's very easy to sort of... And I think that was even the point of the research was that, yes, the world of work is changing, but it's not... Being human is still really important. Mm. And so we need to make sure that we don't just uh, sort of resign ourselves mm. to our fate. And I think it's the same thing with education. It's really easy to paint a negative story of what's happening and I think teachers are under a lot of pressure, but, yes. uh, but there are still people doing amazing work around yes. the world. And it's the same thing with things like the NHS or other mm. services. Mm. They have pressures, but there are people doing amazing yeah. work and innovating. And it's important to celebrate some of those stories, isn't it? Have it you is. come across um, any yeah. success stories you yeah, can share I, with them? Yeah, of course. Yeah, so I think um, one school that we do a, a bit of work with here in London is um, called School 21, which you may or may not be familiar with. Um, it's featured in a book with Charlie Ledbetter that we did called Problem Solvers. And they do a really brilliant job. They, they serve students who come from sort of all backgrounds. These are not sort of the uh, most affluent. These are students who English might be their second language. Mm -hmm. But they do a brilliant job of balancing knowledge and sort of the importance of facts of learning those things, but also with real world experiences and real world learning. Um, and so they have this idea of creating beautiful work for authentic audiences so that you're not just doing homework, but that you're creating things that would stand up and, be, and show, show off in the world. And so they encourage kids to um, do drafts, to work with experts. And so we're actually getting to work with them on a, another podcast series that we're doing with Nevertheless, where they are actually creating the podcast themselves. And, we're right. and so we're mentoring them a school in South Africa and actually a school in Virginia. And so it's yes. it's been really awesome because we have a team of experts that have helped do some mentorship, but we've actually turned over the keys to them. Yeah. And these students are coming up with really brilliant ideas. And so those are the things that get me most excited. Yeah. And I'm sure it's the same for you as when you get out of the office and you get to see some of the kids that are coming up with brilliant ideas. Yes. So is that a podcast series our listeners can access? They can. It's the, nevertheless, it's on your iTunes. It's on, you can go to a website neverthelesspodcast.com and there's great work with um, amazing experts around the world and hopefully we'll be able to share some of the audiences and share and join up with you. Fantastic, great. Now, my book, Seven Skills for the Future, as you know, it focuses on seven skills, empathy, adaptability, integrity, critical thinking, being proactive, being resilient and being optimistic. Right. So it's those seven. Um, tell us a little about how that might relate to no, I think those, those, those things are definitely things that we're seeing that emerge from the research. Things like resilience are incredibly important. Mm -hmm. And I'm sort of reminded, you know, this idea of having one job that you mm -hmm. do for your entire life, you know, all the research sort of points to the idea that we're going to have to be learning new traits, new skills. People are living longer. The idea that this is the first generation that five generations of individuals are in the workforce at the same time is pretty remarkable. Mm -hmm. And so the ability to learn new skills, learn new jobs, and also, it, you know, it's not the easiest thing in the world. You know, we say upskilling, but it's mm -hmm. actually quite difficult. And so resilience and the ability to face that is important, not just when you're entering the workforce, mm -hmm. but even as you get a little bit older and to be able to keep learning. So definitely an important skill and something that will be important for the future. Yeah, I couldn't agree more. And we've certainly talked about young people um, and uh, talking about slightly older people. Yeah. What are some of the skills? I mean, you've mentioned resilience, and that's really important. But what are some of the other skills that older people might need to be, you know... So, so this is about? that's actually a topic that I think is incredibly important and something that I don't think gets brought up enough. And we've, we've done some work with Pearson, and but also just in the wider sector of bringing attention to sort of ageism and some of the... Mm -hmm. the, the the areas it's, it's not as sexy as some of those other topics but actually um, older people contribute a, a ton to the workforce and it's something that a lot of the skills that they bring are ones that are uniquely human so you what you often find with people who have been in the workforce for a longer period of time is that while they may not be quite as versed on the newest um, bit of technology mm -hmm. or vision they do have these soft skills that computers that mm -hmm. things can't um, have. They have this ability to work with people. They have the ability to communicate. And so I think for, for older individuals, when you look at what it takes to stay employable, it's actually very similar to, the, to people who are coming into the workforce mm -hmm. for the same mm -hmm. time. 
And so I think it takes people who are willing to be curious, who are willing to learn, who are willing to just put their hand up and say, hey, I don't know. And I think that's something important, whether you're entering the your um, first job or whether you're in your fourth or fifth yes. job. Yes. Be, and, and what's really important as well, not just for older individuals, but also for employers, is that we do a better job of helping to support mm-hmm. that and also making sure that we don't let sort of bias subtly creep in there mm-hmm. because... You know, diversity is not just about gender. It's not just about um, race. It's also about making sure we get the best out of everyone. Mm. Do you think we'll see a, um, a rise or a comeback, possibly, of more mentoring in the workplace? I, I hope so. We do. We've we've had the privilege of getting to work with a great group of people at um, Network Rail who do some really awesome work with apprenticeships and really invest there. And they're working to try to make it easier. I forget what the name of the program is. We can we can find it later. Um, where it makes people who've left the workforce, make mm-hmm. it easier for them to come back and do mentorships, be able to provide some of that experience yeah. they would have. You know, the idea of engineers who have um, maybe been out of the profession for a little bit, they have tons of skills yes. and sets. And so I think not just in engineering, but in other professions, mentorships are, are yeah. very, very important. And it's particularly important in education and think about how we, you know, a lot of times those are the individuals that understand what, um, in what, what homework looks like in reality mm. can help translate those things for students. Mm. And what do you think about reverse mentoring? So young people. I think it's one of the skills. one of my one of the things that I think is most interesting when we think about um, problems of technology and how we think about it. There's a lot of discussion around screen time and about, for example, yes. like how students um, maybe spend too much time on their phone. And I think that's right, and parents should think about that, but I actually think a lot of times we have a lot that we can learn from younger individuals because they're actually wrestling with these questions just as much as we are. And so one of the things that we try to do with this uh, podcast series is actually say the best thing that we can do is start a dialogue about these issues. And so it's trying to move from a state of fear to a place where we can have a conversation. You know, one parent said that she brought her her, her kids in and said, you know, let's just put Snapchat up on the screen. You can tell me, what does this do? What does this do? Mm-hmm. And it's not so much trying to be invasive, but it's just trying to ask questions. And so if you can create that dialogue where you're both learning together, it means that some of those maybe soft issues that um, students or about younger people might need support in, like how to navigate those things, mm-hmm. that they'll feel like they can ask those questions because they're seeing that it's a two-way reciprocal and yes. respectful street. Yes. I'm going to try that with my son. He's 11 and he's... We've been holding out getting him a mobile phone, but I well, think it's I'm on the a, horizon. <laughs> my, my, I'm a, I, I have a little brothers that are still at home, and so I always try to encourage my father when it comes to things like, I'm sure if you guys hear Fortnite, you know, the video mm-hmm. game, and I try to encourage my dad to to engage in a dialogue and not yes. be so fearful about it. And it pay, yeah. it does pay dividends, because yeah. if, you're, if you operate from a position of fear... Um, children or students will retract and they'll hide Mm -hmm. and that doesn't help anyone out because then these issues just come up in other ways yes yes so looking ahead to 2019 and beyond and going up to 2030 what are some of the plans that you guys have yeah so we're trying to do more things that will help um, support this idea of lifelong learning one of the sort of not surprising but the good news bits of uh, the research pointed to the need for educators that the the role of the teacher is not going to go away it may Mm -hmm. change Um, But we don't think that artificial intelligence or anything like that will be able to replace a teacher. And so while teachers' roles are going to change, we're going to need to do a better job of supporting it. So we're trying to think of how our um, tools and technology can better align with what's happening in the classroom. Mm -hmm. We're trying to create better on-roads for people to have those upskilling opportunities. So that means... Um, you know, being able to get new credentials, new training in the U.S. There's a, a really amazing program where it allows people who work at uh, restaurants like uh, Maggiano's or Chili's, kind of a uh, you know family type restaurants, to be able to get their associate's degree, to get their sort of creden- basic credentialing that's really important for free with local community colleges, mm-hmm. so that the employer picks up the tab for that and it makes it and they have support. And so I think. We want to be a partner that helps provide that link between the employer and the university. We can't replace the university yeah. either, but we can provide the connective tissue. And so yes. we're trying to be an ecosystem partner yeah. that can be trusted. Yeah, okay. I mean, there's been lots of talk about universities not being, you know, graduates coming out with very low employability skills, uh, not being able to find work and so on. I, what, what, can you tell us more about the sure. work you're so doing some, in that area? Yeah, so one of the things I thought was really interesting and... We had an event at Pearson College here in London the other week, and we had a number of uh, degree apprentices who were there. And the idea of not just choosing one or the other, of being able to go to university, Mm -hmm. but still do an apprenticeship at 
one of the individuals was from L'Oreal, another one was working at Comedy Central. And it's sort of understanding that those soft skills that you get in university, I did a liberal arts degree, that's very important, but it's also really important to make sure that you're getting that real world experience. And so encouraging universities to help see how those things intersect. Mm -hmm. So that's one area, you know, hopefully we'll see a rise of more internships, but at Mm -hmm. the same time, it's really important that we make sure that internships, apprenticeships are, you know, paid, that they provide Mm -hmm. support for students, and that it's not just the most affluent who are able to take advantage of that. Yeah, I I mean, you talked earlier about there being pockets where we see good examples of stuff happening in schools. Do you see that in universities as well? Yeah, it is, and so... The example of the degree apprentices over here, we know that that's a highly in demand. I think there was it was a number of a few thousand applications for like sixty places. So we see that as, as something that's in demand. Um, there are a few universities over here. Um, uh, James Dyson has invested in the of the technology company over here has invested in creating a university where it allows students to get their engineering degree, but also to get paid to work and do real world practice. Um, so it's it's more of those sort of um, breaking down those sort of barriers and that being important and and it's as well it's encouraging I thought it was really exciting to hear of a school where you know a lot of these students would go on into the Russell Group sort of universities but their head is encouraging them to go do apprenticeships to go do internships Mm -hmm. um, rather than just doing a gap year and so I think the more that we can help people see that those sort of pathways are for everyone that Mm -hmm. you know and making you know the importance of FE the importance of these areas then I think that's something that it excites me. Yeah. So the way you talk, uh, is, it, it makes the future sound exciting and full of opportunity. Um, <laughs> I, I hope so. Yeah. I mean, I, I have to, I, I, you know, maybe it's the same for you, but I have to look at some of the good things because if I get on Twitter, if I get on the news, there's mm. enough things in the world yes. that can depress me. And, uh, you know, someone, someone very wise told me um, after a U.S. election and just said, you know, all we can do is... To, to be kind and to do good and to try to improve the world with those that we are around each day. And so, you know, I I don't think it's naive. I think it's very inspiring to focus on the good stories, to see where those those pockets. And I think it's a responsibility of companies like Pearson or big companies to realize that we have a, a bigger goal than just, um, you know, there's sort of this argument about what type of company you should be. And I think for an education company, you're not just about clicks. Mm-hmm. You're not just about attention. You're about trying to improve students' lives and about mm-hmm. their outcomes. And that's something that sometimes means you give students what they don't like. Mm-hmm. Sometimes mm-hmm. means that you have to have some hard truths, but it's it's more important. And so I think education's messy, and whatever I can do to help support the people that are doing messy but good work, then it does give me optimism. Um, but yes, and then I just try to stay off Twitter as much as possible. Yeah, <laughs> so great. That's really good to hear you say, and I, and I agree with you so much about uh, so many of the things that you've been talking about. And I know our listeners will want to find out more about the 2030 research yeah, so it's, it's, doing. So you can see it. It's on futureskills.pearson.com, mm-hmm. and you can go on, and you can actually you can explore the research in a traditional way, but you can also go in and enter your age, which... Um, may or may not be scary and it'll tell you what how old you'll be at 2030 <laughs> oh, that, is, that is actually quite scary it's for me scary for I think everyone um, <laughs> and it'll and you can see what your occupation is and it'll also tell you what are the skills that you should be cool. going okay. and looking after and to, to make yourself more employable okay. yeah. and so I think you know the biggest thing is that you know the future can be optimistic we yeah. need to take responsibility for it. and the other thing I would just stress that I don't think I've said is just the importance of arts the importance of the you know these these sort of areas that often get siloed mm-hmm. and that was part of the reason we wanted to do this research was because it highlights that importance but it's, it's part of a multidisciplinary process rather than just being in an isolation thank you so much Nathan can you just give us that website sure again future skills.pearson.com and you can also listen to this podcast at nevertheless podcast.com and uh, yeah Thank you so much. So uh, that was my guest, Nathan Martin, Director of Global Thought Leadership at Pearson. Thank you, Nathan. Thank you. It's lovely to be here. Thank you so much, Nathan, for coming onto the show. It's been really great to have you with us. Um, if you'd like to know more about these seven skills, just go to unimenta.com where you'll find lots of extra tips and resources. And of course, buy the book, Seven Skills for the Future, available online and in all major bookstores. Thank you very much for listening. See you next time.